I learned to love stories from my grandmother. And I didn't just learn to love to listen to them. I learned to love the way she cleared her throat like she was brushing the years old dust off the cover of a picture book. The way her eyes sparkled when she knew the whole audience was wrapped up in every word. The way a whole room went quiet when she spoke. Stringing words together until they're less like words and more like poetry, music, art. I learned to love stories from my grandmother. She told stories of little boys and not so little girls, of love and heartbreak, of how, it f of how she worked every day to save lives, but also how it feels when the lives around you end. She told stories over cinnamon rolls and ginger creams, never seeming to pause for air, but sometimes stopping to dip one finger in the vanilla icing, winking at me as if she were a little girl again. I learned to love stories from my grandmother. I learned to love stories because she filled my ears with words and eventually I learned to carefully place them into my heart. She reminded me that without these words, without these stories, there is no music, no paintings, no poetry. She reminded me that without these words, we must not go on. Listen, she told me. Listen to everything. And now she would tell me, stand up and speak. Anthropologists tell us that storytelling is fundamental to human existence, a valuable form of human expression that gives us both, that propels us, gives us both useful information and emotional connections and propels us forward as a human race. This is the Chauvet Cave in France. It is filled with intricate drawings more than 30,000 years old that depict epic bison and deer hunts, demonstrate how to skin an antelope, show how to build a fire. While marine scientists have still never seen a great white shark reproduce, historians know nearly every detail about ancient Mesoamerican societies solely from their Cody's writing systems. On another hand, Native American history is nearly entirely learned and passed down through the oral tradition. These examples seem contradictory. Drawings on a wall versus scrolls of coded language versus a tale woven by an old Sioux grandmother in a rocking chair. But at their core, they are all the same thing. Stories. They reflect a universal language that all can understand and appreciate. These stories mean as much to the people who created and shared them as they do to the scientists who uncover them today. While humanity's ancestors just wanted to tell a couple people about a hunt or a way of worship, so historians find these same stories to be keys, crucial to the unlocking the mysteries of who we are and where we came from. These forms of communication have evolved to become something far greater than just a passing of patterns between a teller and a listener. They have drawn lines that span the globe with no regard for language barriers, cultural differences, sorry, or <laughs> military borders. As Frank Rose stated in his book, The Art of Immersion, we tell stories to make sense of the world and to share that knowledge with others. Without storytelling, we would never know what it is like to live anything but our own lives. This thought has terrified me for as long as I can remember. When I was little, I would ask my cousins to describe their days to me. This confused them. They wanted to tell me about the exciting parts of their life when all I honestly wanted to know was whether or not they ate breakfast before getting dressed or after, and who they sat with at lunch, and whether they could see the stars at night when the sun set. I wanted to close my eyes and imagine what it was like to be an author's daughter in Texas, or part of a farm family in Wisconsin, or to be a boy homeschooled in the bush of Tanzania, because all I knew was what it was like to be a little girl growing up at the base of the Rocky Mountains. And I didn't discredit this, I made sure that after my cousins had told me about themselves, I got to tell them about how blue the sky is here on a clear day, the way that the morning fog sinks to the bottom of the valley and then uncloaks the mountains as the sun rises, how quiet it gets when it snows. I wanted them to know these things. I needed them to know these things because how could we all possibly be okay with living just one life? As I got older, I learned about how truly big and very different the world is, and this issue only intensified. I would sit in airports for hours on end and imagine entire lives for the people who moved around me. 
That tall girl over there drinking water, she's surely one from the trees. What else could those long arms be used for besides swinging from branch to branch? That man wearing hiking boots, I'm sure he's slept on every single one of the seven summits. That mom balancing seven Starbucks coffees, I think she travels with the circus when she's not busy carpooling her triplet daughters to and from soccer practice. And that little girl holding up seashells to her ears, she's listening to the ocean because one day she'll find it and never leave its side. These are stories I invented for people. Through them, I could, in a way, live other lives. But it was still so safe and protected. And it, as I found out, when it comes to real life and real stories, they will always have, they, all, they will always win when it comes to crazy. This is a couple I met on a boat trip in the British Virgin Islands. They had a booth at an Oceanside flea market, and they sold everyday items, hats, bags, sunglasses cases, all made out of different flags. The day we went, it was pouring rain, the kind of rain you would never see here. We took refuge under the couple's tent, and I asked them where they got all of their flags. The man told me, in heavily accented and broken English, that they had sailed all around the Atlantic for seven years, up and down the Caribbean, all along the eastern coast of South America, and they stopped at every boat they found that was flying a flag. They would moor close to the boat and then ask whoever was on board what their story was. His wife told me that they gave no further promptings, but the things they heard and learned from these people was more than they could have ever expected. After talking for just a couple minutes, or sometimes over hours and meals, these two would leave with a whole other life they had learned about, and they always asked their new friend for a piece of their flag. I stood there with my mouth agape. These two had collected hundreds of flag pieces and stitched them together. I couldn't conceive how many people they had met, how many stories they had been told. I asked why they sold them. This was an art form, a lifetime of work put together only to be given away. The man told me, smiling, the world is a puzzle, no? We put together these pieces of the puzzle, but we know the picture already. Unless we share the pieces, the world hides forever. From this moment, I understood why I had always craved others' words. Stories are our histories and our pasts, and the histories and the pasts of everyone who we have ever met. This couple sought to collect pieces of the world, and they found them in the form of stories. In fact, there are parts of myself I only recognize from stories. I don't actually remember my great-grandmother, but I can hear her voice calling down the lake side to call us home for dinner. I was too young to remember living in the shadow of Vail Mountain, but my parents have coached me to recall the warmth of the wood-burning fire in the living room. When we truly listen to stories, we can learn about other cultures in a way that history books will never be able to replicate. All of humanity deserves to understand the journeys that individuals and that have pushed individuals and the larger groups they belong to forward. And this compassion will propel us towards a fuller understanding of this diverse world. Just like the couple and their flags that I found in the pouring rain, we must stitch together our own stories to add to the puzzle that is the world. Every piece is different, but without them, as my grandmother would tell me, there is no final picture. Stories transpose all barriers that misunderstanding has ever made, and they build bridges to connect worlds that would otherwise never come together. This is the impossible connection that we seek through stories one that allows us to live other lives. This is a video from my longest free dive ever, my personal record. Free diving is deep diving without the support of compressed air. Beneath the water, more bridges are made. Diving deep on a single breath, words become silence. During this dive, as I neared the three minute mark, my lungs began to burn. My muscles twitched and every part of my body willed me to return to the surface. But as I prepared to end my dive, I looked into the eyes of the sea turtle. I matched his gentle glide, the calm way that he surveyed the beauty of the ocean floor before him. I was able to slow down and see clearly. I no longer felt the need to return to the comfort of air. As we swam together in sync, although no words or gestures were exchanged, I understood his world and I heard his story. The impossible connection is there. It is moving, living with every living thing, 
waiting for us to find the pieces of the world, to find the words and hold them close to our hearts. The pieces of the world are waiting. We just have to listen. Thank you.